My name is James Turner. I am the president and chairman of the board of the Bernie Thank You Fund. Um, thank you. I am going to be uh, your host for this evening. Uh, I'd like to start by giving a couple of thank yous. I'd like to thank Casey and EQLA for uh, graciously offering to host us here after uh, we decided to change venues to something where there might actually be people in town. Um, I'd like to thank Amy Keating Rogers, who was the person who got me hooked up with Lauren uh, and uh, poked her a couple of times when emails weren't going through. So that was great. I'd like to thank uh, Aaron Campbell at CalArts, who has continued to believe in us as we said, hey, we want to create an animation scholarship from Bronies. Um, as well as our student guests we have here tonight from CalArts, who hopefully uh, will both ask some interesting questions and maybe learn something along with the rest of us. And of course, all of you generous donors who have uh, increased this night, I can tell you that we have raised over $6,000 to increase the endowment with this event. You know, this is almost redundant to this crowd, but you know, I can safely say that our guest tonight has had a strong impact on the world of animation. She's worked in some of the most iconic shows of the last 15 to 20 years and at least one landmark movie. Uh, she's also been a very strong advocate for strong female role models in animation as well as women in the industry. So it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce our guest for tonight, Lauren Faust. Slides. All right. So we will begin as it is at the beginning with the, the just get it out of your system now. We have about 20 bit, 20 kid pictures. Well, and you didn't have to use all of them. <laughs> there was so much DAW. Um, all right. So let us start with an official Wikipedia correction so that we can put this little clip up and, you know, point to it from Wikipedia and, and correct it. So Wikipedia says you were born in Annapolis, but you weren't. No. Where were you born? Uh, San Jose, California. Yep. Um, so how long did you live in San Jose? I don't know. My dad was in the Navy, so we moved around a bit. I, I got lucky that, you know, we landed in Severna Park, Maryland, which is near Annapolis around the time I was seven and, and stayed there until I was 17. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I think we moved away from San Jose when I was two, maybe. Okay. So Faust is obviously an interesting name with some uh, operatic, at least, uh, <laughs> connotations. Um, what is the ancestry of your um, family? Um, well, Faust is German, but um, the Faust side of my family, I think, is the part of my family that was in the U.S. the longest, so I don't know how much German was actually left over on my dad's side, yep. but three of my grandparents were pure bloods, I guess you could say, uh, Scottish, Lithuanian, and Polish, so that's oh. mostly it. Probably your people oppressed my people because I'm... They're, it's possible. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's okay. Um, so, as you mentioned, you're a Navy brat. Um, your dad was um, an engineer. Yes. Um, like on planes or on boats or on... Planes. planes. He, he designed planes. He was also a pilot in cool. the Navy. Cool. Um, did you see him a lot as a kid? Um, yeah, um, he, uh, especially once we moved to uh, Maryland, he was stationed, he worked at the, the Naval Academy and he was there, so he had like a job, it wasn't, he wasn't being sent out and right. stationed places anymore. Go, go, go to exciting places, see exciting people and kill them type of thing, wasn't happening so much in the world. I don't think he killed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> As an engineer, we hope he never killed anybody. I don't, I don't think that any killing was going on while he was in the Navy. Right. So um, this or is showing. Anyway. This is this is uh, your brother, your older brother Jason. Yes, and my mom Karen. Yep. 
So, um, and this is, I guess, Christmas? Yes, I think that was my, if that looks like my first Christmas, yes. Right. So, um, you had the luxury, at least when you were young, you had a stay-at-home mom. Yes. Um, which for, especially, your, so you're, you're firmly an ex. Um, Gen, Gen X? Gen X, yes. Yes, correct. Uh, so that was somewhat unusual for Gen Xs. They're, my life likes to say that they were the generation raised by wolves. <laughs> um, yeah, no, not, not me. Stay yep. at home, Mom. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this was just, there's enough commentary, just we can all go again. Yeah, Aww. just flip through yeah. them. <laughs> Except we can not say... You didn't have red hair when you were a kid. I, I, I still don't have red hair. Yes, <laughs> this is you, extremely you, fake. Yes, you did. You, you did have a great mutant, mutant event where, like, you were exposed to a red-haired radioactive spider or something. Don't I wish. Yes. Um, no, no, yes. this is fake. Okay. It's, a lot, it's very gray now. <laughs> great. So this is just, we're just going to go through. These are some of your candidates. We can talk some points as we go through it. So what were your mom and your dad's like interests like? Were, were either of them artistic or creative? Um, I feel like my mom should have been an artist. Um, she was very creative. Um, I think she expressed herself quite a bit, uh, frankly, as a homemaker. Um, she decorating the house, taking care of the house, um, the way she dressed her kids. She was very creative. So I think, I think the artistic gene came from my mom, but I actually do think it's kind of like a combination of an artistic mind and the engineering mind together. Um, it's interesting, too, because I have three brothers. My youngest has a different dad than I do, um, but the three who came from the engineer are all artistic, and the, the, the one who didn't, uh, a little less so. <coughs> Or you could have been Da Vinci. You could have Maybe. tied it together. <laughs> so this is just one more piece of DAW. And then, so I guess around here. A little uh, older. Yes. That's just in there for the expression. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rainbows. Yes. Rainbows. Always liked rainbows. And there is a pony. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so but in but importantly, we're, we have the beginning of a theme that's in a couple of these pictures. We also have Snoopy in here. Oh, we, yes. yes. So what was the Lots fascination when we have, was it just Snoopy or was it the whole Charlie Brown universe? Uh, no, when I was little, it was just Snoopy. And I think it's just because he was a dog. And I like dogs and I couldn't have a dog. So I had Snoopy. You had a stuffed dog. Yes. And here we see your early, your earliest recorded you gave me <laughs> you're holding crayons yes 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 now there's no evidence here of whether you drew of them or ate them but no um i have been told that i started drawing around the time i was three what were your favorite subjects as a my earliest memory of drawing something was drawing the cast of star wars Ooh. Yes, and being very frustrated because I couldn't figure out why they looked strange until my brother pointed out I was not drawing bodies. I was drawing heads and legs and getting very angry that he gave me notes. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what do you think of... <laughs> and then realizing he was right and yeah. drawing bodies right. from then to this day. Right. Well, when you think about it with the modern thing of, like, all legs animation with, like, you know, Equestria Girls or, you know. Oh, the you, long legs. The long legs. You're just, you're yeah, ahead of, I never you're put that together. Your time, right? Yeah, maybe so. So, just, this is one more da. Yeah, sorry. I think I overloaded the, the kid pictures. Sorry. Well, we're playing to your audience here. <laughs> uh, um, but, okay, so then you had a younger brother come along. Yes, that's right. So now, now you're, you're sandwiched between yes. males. Yeah, in, I, in, I, not in a totally, like, ignore any other connotation, but you're stuck between two males age-wise. Yes, yeah, it was, it was a double middle child because I was, yeah, middle child and only girl. Yeah. Right. So were they the protective types of, of siblings or were they, you know, are we talking <laughs> Foster's level, you know, Older, bro you know, older. Oh uh, well, Jason wasn't as bad as Terrence. Um, <laughs> so here we see some more Snoopy. More showing, Snoopy. Right, and again, this is just in here because just toys. Just because. Now, did you? This, this leads to interesting. Now we know you played with ponies mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, 
Were you strictly a girl toy type of girl, or did you? No. Uh, well, that my I I had only the girl toys, but I played with my brother's toys as well. Um, so they were. Let's see, it's my younger brother mostly, and it was just Transformers, GI Joe. It's a very Hasbro well, house. Yeah, I was gonna say you, you were <laughs> you were keeping in the family. Yeah. Um, now. Um, one of the things I'm wondering, given some of your later things, were there comic books in the house? Yes, my older brother was a total stereotypical comic book nerd with the comics and the plastic bags and everything. And um, Were you allowed to touch them? I was not, um, but I did anyway. And I found out my younger brother and I, like years later, discovered that we were both sneaking into Jason's room, taking his comic books, reading them very carefully, <laughs> putting them back. I used to make a special note of like what side the flap was folded <laughs> over so he wouldn't catch me. Um, yeah, so but he had, he had a hair across the seam and you couldn't see it. And well, <laughs> I'm, I guess not because he never confronted me on it. Right. But uh, yeah, I used to sneak into Jason's room to read his comic books. Right. So um, what were the titles you were reading? I was a Marvel girl, which is kind uh -huh. of ironic, well, yeah. <laughs> as I'm working for DC right now, but um, so, I, uh, X -Men. X Men was the one, yeah. Yeah, I, I had that Belle doll, which was Snoopy's sister in the 80s, and I nearly needed a Snoopy to complete the play. I got Snoopy for Christmas. I was very emotional about it. I really wanted that Snoopy. Right. So this would be about the time there was a major trauma in your life. Yes, yes. Uh, my, f that might be a little later than that, but my, my, uh, my father died of leukemia when I was only seven. Um, he was 33. So that must have kind of tossed the family around a little bit. Well, yeah, to say the least. Um, he was sick for three years um, before he passed away. And um, yeah, it was, you know, it, it's, I didn't know what was going on. They didn't tell me. I knew he was in the hospital. And, you know, when he came home, he didn't have any hair. I knew he was sick, but I didn't know he was going to die. Um, so yeah, that, you know, understandably kind of changed things. Did that change the household finances at all? Or was, were you pretty well taken care of? Uh, we were okay. My, my parents were good savers, and my dad was in the Navy, so um, he kind of set everything up, you know, because, you know, he knew, he knew he didn't have a lot of time, so he tried to set everything up for his family so that we would continue to get what we needed, like, after he died. Like, and the Navy offers a survivor benefit program that makes sure it's that because he was still in the military that his family still got money. So he and my mom set everything up so that we could continue to, to be okay after he was gone. So when did your mother remarry? She remarried around the time I think I was 10. And how did, how did she meet your... Your stepfather was. Uh, he was also in the navy. Uh, he he was he had he was somebody who had worked with my dad. Okay, so here we're going to see another recurring theme. Okay, is, now we go into nerd territory. Yes. <laughs> yes. Less cute, more nerd. Yes. So I don't know. I think that's really cute. Oh, but, thank you. But so, when did you start? I mean, it seems like for, as we'll see later, you've had a uh, a. Um, relationship with cosplay and costuming for a long time. Yes. Um, when did that, was it just like kids play dress up and that just, you just kept going on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it started with that. It's, you know, Halloween was like some ways better than Christmas. Um, it was exciting to not just dress up, but, you know, as an artistic kid and with my brothers being artistic to also, um, you know, make our own costumes. So I think it was just more artistic expression. It was something exciting for me. I think I, the only reason I stopped dressing up for Halloween was, you know, work got too busy. I think I was around 26. <laughs> and I miss it. Well, you know, a lot. When, you go, when you go to cons, you know, Tara started the whole thing with dresses Twilight. She so has you... more time than I do. Yeah. <laughs> 
You probably have legions who would help you if you but asked them, but... I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> uh, so one thing we haven't talked about yet is, you know, you were obviously going through school and you were actually in one school system through most of this, which is yes. unique. So what were kind of your passions and interests and things that started to turn you on in school? Um, it was always art, like, always. Um, uh, I tried sports, I tried music, none of it stuck. But I, I, it, was, it was art all the time, always. Did you struggle in other subjects, or was it just like you did the other subjects so you could do art? Yeah, that was basically it. I, I kind of got really good at, at learning what I, the bare minimum I had to do to be, get Bs and A minuses, so I just did that <laughs> so that I could, you know, okay. focus on what I enjoyed. So you were reading comments, you, were, you had had the exposure ponies. Were you a Saturday morning cartoon type of gal? Oh, yeah. What were, what were the shows you were watching? You were, um, in, you were in the wasteland a little bit. I was. There was a lot of crap. Um, <laughs> a lot. I'm trying to remember what I liked. Um, I think you would have been, around six or seven, you would have started to have Dungeons and Dragons was on. I don't know if you watched yeah, it. Yeah, I watched that a little bit. Um, uh, Saturday morning? What did I watch on Saturday mornings? I mean, I watched all of it. I'm just trying to remember what on Saturday morning hit me. Like, Smurfs, but I can't say, like, I loved Smurfs. I, like, yeah, I watched Smurfs. Well, what else Sco was going on in the 80s? I never liked Scooby-Doo. Well, there was Transform I think Transformers was going. I watched Transformers. That wasn't Saturday morning. That was after school. See, yeah, I'm nerdy enough to know that. Right. Um, what was Saturday morning and what was after school? Right. I can't really say. Like, I was Disney movies. Like, I wanted to see Disney movies. And I enjoyed watching Looney Tunes because they played those on Saturday mornings. Right. I watched all the rest of the Saturday morning stuff, but that was the stuff I was really into. Um, but then when I was probably too old for cartoons, but I had a very little brother, so I had an excuse. I, start, I got into the Disney afternoon stuff, uh, DuckTales and yeah. Rescue Rangers and, and Gummy Bears. Um, well, then that's, off, when, yeah. th that's when they started getting better. And, and like, if you look at the history of t uh, animation TV, that's actually kind of like when well, that plus animation Spiel the better. stuff Spielberg started doing. Yeah, like, Tiny Toons. And Animaniacs. Yeah, and yeah. Early, the... early Tiny Toons was good, but if you watch, keep watching it, like, I think that's when I started learning about production value. Mm -hmm. Like, you'd, you'd turn it on, you go, like, those drawings are good, that's going to be a good episode. And you go, yeah. those are terrible, oh, this is going to be a yeah, terrible and, and, episode. And then you watch the end, and, oh, it was that studio, that's yeah, why. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. So, um, you were also kind of in the period when... Um, Female empowerment, I mean, this was kind of like, in, in some ways it was almost like after the peak was the 70s was like, you know, the, the, the start of the first crest of the female empowerment. And then the 80s, there was almost a little bit of retrenchment. But, mm -hmm. you know, what was, you know, were you starting to get an awareness of, of how women were seen in society then? Or were you too busy just drawing? No, I, I think... It's not that you learn, it's not that you get an awareness of like how women are treated, you, you suddenly get an awareness that you're being treated differently. That, that's, that's what it is. And I think I got it pretty early because I had brothers, you know, so I was like, and, and, and no sisters. So I was like very aware of like what they were getting and what I wasn't. Um, funnily enough, TV was part of it. I liked the shows my brothers watched and I hated the shows that were for girls. Mm. So. For instance, My Little Pony was my favorite toy. I was very excited when the show would come on, and then I thought the show was terrible, so I didn't watch it. I was like, I like what I'm doing, the stories I'm telling for myself with my toys more than I liked the show. But then I'd go watch, like, you know, like, like, Robotech. <laughs> and be like, why can't this be for girls? You know, so, so I kind of got a, like, a weird... M mishmash creatively of like liking the sorts of things that were thematically for boys, which they're not, I mean, but that's what they thought then, but liking yeah. things that were for girls, you know, con so content for boys, but things for girls. Well, that, that's kind of interesting. Well, because when you think about, like you said, you like Disney movies a lot. Mm -hmm. Disney movies try to go for that sweet spot of enough action and things so that the young males will want to see them, but 
princesses. So you... Yeah, this, this, in this day and age they do, but you know, back in the 50s, the boys had no problem going to see Cinderella. I, yeah. I don't know when all of a sudden that beca- you know, cooties kicked in and no one, if it's, oh, that movie's about a girl, so I'm not going to watch it. All right, so now we get to see Goff Lauren. <laughs> I was a mod. <laughs> yes. Yes. How long did that period last? Uh, I don't know. It's still happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, um, I, I think um, I started doing that around 15, I think. And yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of, I don't know if that really stopped. Right. <laughs> I just don't pull it off well right. anymore. By, by this point, were you starting to think that some, were you just thinking art was going to be a career, or were you thinking animation specifically? By the time I got to college, or to high school, yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I, had a, I was very interested in biology, um, uh, zoology in particular, working with animals, but um, I don't know, I can't remember the exact moment it dawned on me that being an animator could be a job that you could have, and then I was like, oh, well, I'm going to do that. Were there any particularly um, memorable or inspirational teachers you had in high school? In high school? Yeah. No. <laughs> I wish I could say I could. I had teachers that I liked who were nice, but... Um, there wasn't they, that one that just like lit your You know what? I was shy. I was painfully, 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 horribly shy. And most of my teachers, I don't think, noticed I existed. And boys. <laughs> right. So we have a little uh, preview of Futures yes. to Come. Yes. It would be a while before you got there, but... Yeah, well, that was, that was actually it was a very memorable trip. That's in Disney World, Florida. But um, I don't know if ever, anybody remembers the fishbowl they used to have there. It was called the fishbowl. Um, they actually had animators in that you could watch through windows at Disney World um, that were working. I remember when I was there, they were working on Rescuers Down Under. So they'd take you on a tour through this one building and tell you about the animation process. And um, there's this area where there's just like this giant wall of windows and you watch the animators animate. And like now looking back, I'm like, oh, those poor people. Yeah. Do, um, do, not, do not tap or disturb the animators. Yeah, network. no, it was pretty bad, but that was a very inspirational time. There were a couple things that happened that were really big for me. One was that, you know, some of the artists who were towards the front of the mi- window, I saw somebody had a big collection of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures at the top, and I was like, oh, these are my people. <laughs> um, like, adults who have toys. Um, so that was a big, like, I, that's, yes, I should be doing that and being with those people. And um, the other thing was that my, my stepdad, um, like, told, I was mortified. Uh, I, was so sh- I was so shy, but my dad told um, the, uh, the tour guide, oh, my daughter can draw really good and she wants to be an animator. Because they have never, ever heard that before. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but he, the tour guide was really nice. He had us hang behind. He, the rest of the tour went on and, and we hung out and he came back out with a sheet of paper with like, at the time, it was only like six schools that Disney Studios recruited from. And uh, one of those schools was CalArts. That, that's where I learned about CalArts. So that was all on that trip. But, you know, my mom made me take this picture because like, you know, oh, Lauren, you like animation? Take a picture with the Disney animation thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's how she talks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you have, so first of all, um, other than maybe that. Yeah, Halloween. Uh, right. That was uh, my, you know, <laughs> angsty, irreverent phase. Right. Uh, <laughs> did you have a plan B if you didn't get into no. animation? Nope. So that would have been your plan B, presumably. Maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, So, um, also, just here's some early artwork, I guess, you worked on. Yeah, that was, um, you know, I just thought I'd include that. I don't have a lot of pictures of me doing art, but the the school play in my 11th grade, my junior year, was a musical, and they asked me to paint a box for the drama teacher. So, there it is. Yep. 
It's pretty. It's Freddie uh, Moore you're... inspired, if anybody knows who that is. Mm-hmm. Old Disney animator guy. Yep. Yeah, that was like... Cats uh, join in. Yeah, I think it was like... Uh, was it like Fun and Fancy Free and some of that stuff? Yeah, that yeah. was... Uh, yeah, that's yeah, all the cats join in. Yep. So here's some evidence you have actually had exposure to an actual equine. Yes. <laughs> um, yep. So do you still ride? Or? No, I wish I could. I only did for a couple of years. There just wasn't access to horses, <laughs> yeah. which sounds weird, but yeah, that's, I miss it. Yep. It was so fun. So now we have, this is some okay, of your high school Okay, this art. is embarrassing. Everybody just forgive me, but yeah, high school art. Actually, I looked at this, and I, you know, this is, this is the difference between self-criticism and I was, I looked at it and said, wow, that's really nice. I was really into Brian Froud. Does anybody know who Brian Froud is? Yep. The artist behind um, Dark Crystal. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess this is just a character It's a life drawing class, yep. yeah. And your Picasso period. Yes. <laughs> Angsty teen. <Arr>. Yeah. <laughs> I, I won some prizes for that one. Um, so in your senior year, you had another disruption in that you weren't where you were, right? Oh, you, yeah. You were in Pennsylvania. Yes, I had to move my senior year of high school. It was awful. <laughs> uh, this is my high school graduation um, with my mom and my grandmother. So your mom is still alive. It's, yes. Yes. I'm going to just randomly guess your grandmother probably isn't. Just, no, you know, no. We all lose them over time. So, you, when you, was there any other place you applied other than CalArts? No. Okay, so this is kind of fun. Um, I was applying to all the, uh, my plan was to apply to all the schools on that list, um, and uh, that was, CalArts was the one I wanted. Um, so I got my portfolio together for CalArts and sent that off and then started working on my other portfolio stuff and was being very lazy and falling behind and starting to stress out, like, oh, I'm not going to get these done in time. And then my acceptance letter came in from CalArts and I went, screw those other places. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I, I didn't bother applying anywhere else. So that was your first time on your own, presumably? Yes. And mm-hmm. on the other side of the country. Yes. Was From that a little, Pennsylvania to California. Yeah, yeah. Well, most of the way to the other side of the country. Was it intimidating for you? It was terrifying. Um, yeah, it was really scary. But like the, the silver lining of having to move my senior year of high school, which was very upsetting when it happened. Um, and and ha- the transition was pretty hard. Like I was pretty miserable for the first semester of my senior year. But then I, f- I made friends and I did okay. And the fact that I could move from my friends, who I thought were like the only people in the world who could ever be my friends, I moved away from my Maryland friends, thinking I'd never love again. Um, and made new friends, made me like brave enough to want to move to California. Um, so my stepdad, again, uh, at first I was still, when I was still nervous about it and still a little uncertain about it, my dad, uh, took me out here. He had a business trip. He brought me with him and, uh, took me, he wanted me to see CalArts and, um, it was a holiday weekend or something like that. And, um, the school was closed and my stepdad, who's kind of a pushy guy, and if my mom was here, this never would have happened. He, we snuck into the school. Um, and the door to the um, animation department was actually propped up with a trash can. <laughs> and like we never would have got in otherwise, so we like, snuck into that. And, you know, um, how many people are here going to CalArts right now? Okay, so the animation department, it's two floors, and I, I don't know what it is now, but at the time it was just all cubicles where everybody did. Is it, is it the same? Okay, yeah, so it was just like cubicles where everybody had their desks and their drawings up, and I was just sneaking around the cubicles and looking at people's drawings, and there was like model sheets from Beauty and the Beast up, and like you couldn't find that stuff back then because this was pre-internet, and I was just like, oh my God. Um, so again, it was another moment of like, these are my people. 
And like that really kind of pushed me forward into the idea that like this is somewhere I need to be. And, and this is kind of interesting. This is a new development. When I was sneaking through the cubicles, there were two guys there who were working. I guess they were working on assignments over the holiday and they like asked us what the hell we were doing there. Um, and my stepdad again was like, oh, this is my daughter and she draws really good. Um, so he made me, and I was mortified again, he made me show my portfolio to these two guys and they really liked it and they gave me a little advice and they encouraged me and they told me I should really apply or that I should apply and that I, I had a really good chance of getting in. They thought it was great and they you know, gave me a lot of confidence and I did and uh, one of those guys is uh, working for me right now. <laughs> He's awesome. He's so good. He's, he's a director on my new show, and, and I love working for him. But it was funny, because when I interviewed him, I, couldn't, I wasn't sure if it was him or not. I thought it was, and I wasn't sure. And then he told me the story, and it was, hey, it was remember, awesome. Remember me? I had the embarrassing dad. <laughs> yeah, right. No, and he even mentioned that. Like, he yeah. said, like, you were a different human being back then. He said, like, he talked about how my hair was in my face, and I was all hunched over, and I, like, I could barely talk any more than this. You know, it's like, yeah, it's a different, different human being. So what was the CalArts experience like for you? Um, CalArts was, the, the thing about CalArts was, you know, I had a lot of great teachers, but I feel like I learned just from osmosis, just from being around, like, other kids like me and being immersed in this creativity and seeing what other people were doing and kind of, like, what it does to your brain and how it makes you think forward. So, like, that was the biggest part of CalArts to me. Like, that, that's just, just being there made you learn. Um, this is a life drawing from, you know, the marathon life drawing classes we had to take. Uh, it's like, Remember, I kind of made a breakthrough when I started inking, okay. using ink. Remember, this next one, this is fine art. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so was there a lot of nude studies there? Or? Oh, they were all nudes. Yeah. yeah. And mostly women, which was frustrating because I'm like, I don't know how to draw men. Uh, <laughs> can you bring some men in here, please? So, yeah, once in a while, one of our teachers would have the, the models put on articles of clothing just to try to, you know, get us to bring out, like, personality and... and well, uh, these days, the computers do all the fabric, so who cares, right? Yes. <laughs> this is just more... And, and these are, like, I, these are my fluke drawings, I got to tell you. These, like, I, I probably, like, went through 50 that I was like, Ugh, no, 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 before I was like, okay, including these. They, I was not this good. <laughs> so you continued cosplay at CalArts. Well, this was before it was called cosplay, and it was just Halloween. Um, <laughs> You're a hip, hipster cosplay. When, when cos, well, it was art school. Everybody <laughs> was trying to one-up each other. So I, 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 but I always, like, when cosplay started, I was like, oh, I'm too old for it. Um, I would have been a huge cosplayer if that was a thing when I was in my early 20s. And those who follow our Twitter account have already seen this. Now, yes. <laughs> that, that, that was committing to an outfit. Yes, yes. And I, I thought I was like super tough shaving my head for a Halloween costume, but then I wore a hat every single day <laughs> until my hair <laughs> grew out again. Great. So um, who else was, you know, bracketing your class or in your class that would be like, Oh, wow, you went to school with that person? Um, let me think. I need to be prepared for questions like that because I'll, I'll be driving home tonight going like, oh, I forgot to mention that guy. Um, who's in my classes? It's kind of like the people before and after me were kind of big deals too. There were a lot of people in my husband's class that ended up being big shots, but I didn't know any of them. Um, the one that comes to mind is, um, uh, is anybody familiar with Don Hall? Uh, yeah, he directed Big Hero 6. Um, he was in my class. Um, I'm blanking, there's gotta be other people. What's that? 
Oh yeah, well, the panel I just came from, the, the Women in Animation panel, my, my roommate Kat Good is a, a director at Disney TV these days. I'm just trying to think if there were any like, um, people who like became big directors. I, like, so many people are just like super like talented and amazing, but maybe not, you might not know their name. Right, they're the people who wa whose work we see all the time, but. Yeah, you don't know their name. You, you've yeah. got to look at the credits. Yeah. Um, so, as I'm sure most, I don't know if they still do it today, I'm sure they do, but you, this is where you got your, your two IMDA, IMDB voice credits. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh -huh. One of them was political correction, and the other one, which, which I can't find on the internet, but oh, the other used one... used to be there. Uh, the other one was Home Honey, I'm High. Yes. Which... <laughs> Which, yes. did you play the, the daughter or the mom? The mom. The I mom. did a terrible job. That, there, that, was, there, were two, there was one other girl who did it before me, and then the director wasn't real thrilled with what she did, so she, he asked me. And then he wasn't real thrilled with what I did, so like half, if you watch it, the mom's voice keeps changing, because he'll use Sadie's voice, and then he'll use mine, and then Sadie's, and then mine, because like, yeah, we both were terrible. I, I, I'm, I it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful parable to the virtues of having an entire household totally toasted. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's the... Yeah. College I students. didn't write it. Yeah. Now, that actually ended up in the Spike and Mike tour, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was a Spike and Mike thing. Yep. That's what all the kids did to, like, make money to, like, eat. Everybody would kind of, on the side, make Spike and Mike films because they didn't really have to be well done. Um, so, like, somebody would just come up with a really gross idea, make a very limited, quick and fast uh, film about it, and then Spike and Mike would give them, like, a thousand bucks. So, in, uh, was, which year was it, uh, Summer, you interned? Uh, I wasn't an intern. I, I saw the summer between sophomore and junior year, I got, I just got a summer job. I got, okay. I got hired to stay out here in California instead of going home just for a few months to do character layout on, on MTV's The Max. So what, that was your first like real gig? I guess that was my first gig. It's funny, it's, I, I, I consider my next job my first job, but this, I guess because this was just a summer thing, but um, yeah, I guess this is my first job, I guess, my first credit. What, was there a sense of, you know, a lot of times, like I know in computer science, which is my usual thing, you know, what they teach in school and what it's like when you put your feet on the ground in a company are two very different things. Was there kind of that shifting of gears where... You know, honestly, I could say, I would say no. It was very much, because at CalArts, you would, they, your, your year-long project was to make a film. I mean, you go to your classes and you do your assignments, or you would do half of them if you were me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but your 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 yearly thesis was to make a film, which meant that you had to go through every part of the animation production process on your own. Um, and a lot of people, like we always used to joke that there was tension between the art school and the animation school because the art school, you guys aren't real artists, you're just learning a vocation. And then the animation people would go like, yeah, well, we're gonna make money. Um, <laughs> which, in retrospect, was really mean. Um, I didn't say it. Um, yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it was, it kind of was a vocation school. Your teachers worked in the industry and they taught you how to make an animated film. So I had already made two films. I had already done layouts. So when I went to work on the Max, Here's an animation desk. Well, I had that at school. And here's animation paper. Well, I had that at school. Here's a pencil. I had that at school, too. Um, and, you know, it was just the only thing that was different was that I had to drive there and stay there all day instead of going to new classes. So it really, it really wasn't that different. What were your two films, by the way? Um, oh, goodness. Um, the first, my first year film was called Yorkshire Terror. And it was about a very annoying Yorkie. Um, and I don't even remember my second year film. My second year film was uh, 
my sophomore year of CalArts is when the Northridge earthquake happened. So I didn't finish it. I think I, it was like two minutes long and I think I animated maybe six scenes in it. Um, most, most kids didn't finish their films that year. <laughs> Um, the school was, was just, well, it wasn't destroyed, but the, sh the school was shut down for the whole second semester. We, they had to, we had to wait for them to move all the equipment to another facility. It just, so yeah, my sec I don't even remember what, I don't remember what it was about, but I don't remember what I called it. Yep. So um, when you came back after, I believe after the, your summer working on the Max, you made a decision, as I recall. Yes, um, so my... It was it was a little after I came. It was it was actually at the end, towards the end of my first semester at um, my junior year at CalArts. One of my animation teacher from my freshman year, not even my current animation teacher, my freshman year um, teacher, asked me if I'd be interested in applying for an animation assistant position on a feature film. So I pulled the only all-nighter I ever have in my life, because um, this is where I learned I can't do all-nighters. Um, I finished up, I had a portfolio already, but I finished up some scenes I was animating and, and shot them so that I had a reel, and, and I, um, I got offered a job. So it was like, you know, I wasn't, I still had a year and a half of school left if I wanted a degree, and, um, you know, do I, do I leave and take the job or do I stay and get my degree? And the only person who told me to stay and get my degree was my stepdad. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, everybody else said, like, don't listen to him. Because um, <laughs> it's like, it's again, it's like, and, and you all, you know, you might know this or you'll find this, you know, in animation, it's, it's not about your level of education, it's about your level of skill. I've worked with people who started working right out of high school. I know a guy who just directed a movie that didn't go to art school, didn't go to college. So it's, it's about your skill set. So everybody encouraged me. They're all like, you might not get offered that job if you stay a year and a half longer. So I took it and I do not have a degree. <laughs> This, this is the important message to, to the, all the college students. Kids, stay in school or you might end up like Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> so the place you went to was to Turner Feature Animation. Yes. And the film you worked on was Cats Can't, Don't Dance. Yes, Cats Don't Dance. So this is the one I consider my first job, and I was desperately, desperately in love with it. So um, tell, talk about, a little bit about what Turner was like at the time. Um, Turner, Turner, I, I came in, the movie was a little bit more than halfway through production, so I was, I was, you know, it was pretty far in when I, when I came in. Um, you know, it was a, it was a little, it was definitely a smaller studio. The only movie they had done before was Page Master. Um, they, they had, um, a setup in a, like, two floor, two or three floors in a, in a bank building next to that old Hanna-Barbera building in Hollywood. Um, but it was, you know, I mean, it was cool. Um, there was a lot of young people there. There were a lot of pe there were a lot of, like, Disney animators who, like, just couldn't, get any movement at Disney, so there was a kind of like a rebellious vibe there. We were also like, you know, at the time, all, you know, all anybody, the only movies that were doing very well, uh, there wasn't a lot of animated movies, were, you know, Disney movies, Aladdin and, you know, princess movies and stuff, so we were all in there going like, we're making cartoony stuff! Squash and stretch, yeah! Like, we were, we were kind of snobby about doing something a little wackier and sillier and, and, like, you know, cartoonier design. But it was, I mean, it was a wonderful environment and just encouraging, and we all just felt like we were doing something different, and that was, like, that was some really, like, excellent fuel. Now, the, the film opened to fairly good critical reviews, but... Did it? I didn't see those. <laughs> well, Wikipedia says so. It, it got respect over time. Yeah. But when it came out, it was a giant flop, and everybody hated it. So, um, Anybody who saw it, so nobody saw it. That was the big thing. Yeah. Well, there's, there seems to have been the theme of just them not knowing how to promote these films. 
No, in that film in particular, Turner Animation, we were like the little rebel studio, and then we got bought by Warner Brothers, and they were kind of like, what's this? So our release was very poor. You know, like, we kind of felt like, when I say we, I mean they, because I was just this lonely junior animator. You know, I had no effect on anybody's opinions, but, like, the producers of the show, like, we... We might have gotten some attention or chance if we had gone out there going like, we're different, you know, check us out because we're different. We're something you've never seen before and we're fun and we're wacky and we're not earnest and we're not princesses. But instead, they, they didn't even, they just gave us a generic release. The commercials were really generic and we weren't in a lot of theaters and so it just didn't do well. But like over time, I remember a few years later, like, the director, Mark Dindle, is fantastic. One of my favorite bosses. And the movie was good enough that Disney scooped him up right afterwards, and he went on to direct Emperor's New Groove, which a lot of people love. It's a wonderful movie. Again, funny, different, fun and cartoony. Um, so it was good enough for that. And then... Uh, f several years later, Disney Channel licensed it and started playing it on the Disney Channel, and all of a sudden, it just got this traction, like, just a little bit, but like people were like, what is this, and where has it been, and why didn't I see it before? So like, as time went on, it, it got respect for being a good, solid, charming little movie. Um, so people who see it love it. Just not a lot of people saw it, but it, it was pretty much a complete failure when it came out. And, and critics weren't nice about it. So what, do, what does a junior animator do? Well, I started animating tails. <laughs> um, people would animate the cat and be too bored or have more important things to do to animate their tails, so that I would do their tails. Um, so, uh, so I've heard of scut work, but you were doing butt work. I guess so. Yes. Um, uh, but I got kind of lucky because, I guess because of some deadlines or some time constraints, they threw some scenes, some dialogue scenes my way because they just, there was nobody else around to do it. So they're like, I'll give the junior animator, give the assistant a chance. And then they liked it. So I just kept getting decent scenes after that. They, they started giving me, you know, juicy yep. Well, not the juiciest dialogue, but they give me some fun dialogue scenes. And this was still in the days of pencil and oh, yeah. the paper? Oh, yeah, the olden days. Yeah, five pieces of paper between your fingers and yep. pencils and pencil sharpeners. What and you, walk, you walked both ways to school, uphill and all that. Yes, yes. in the snow, barefoot. Yes. Yeah. So um, while you... Th th this film has gotten some love over time, I don't think you could say this for Quest for Camelot. Yeah, no. Uh, that movie is a wonderful lesson in what not to do. So you were in this from the beginning? No, oh, no, not at all. No? I, I was on it for just a few months. Um, so when Warner Brothers bought Turner, they just ate all the animators they had. Because Lion King had just came out, so every studio in the world went we need to make animation now because it makes so much money and it doesn't matter if it's good. Um, so I kind of got just transferred over. Um, and, like, I was in development for a little while. They put me on this, they put me on that, and then they're like, we need animators on Quest for Camelot. So they put me on there. I think it was on it maybe five months or something. Was, was there a much. feeling that you were not doing great art when you were working on that? Um... You know, I was lucky because they at least gave me the scenes with Kaylee when she was a little girl, so I got to at least kind of enjoy myself in that sense. But, you know? I, but what I'm more asking is, is you know, could you, because this will certainly come up with the next film we're going to talk about, but do you get a sense when you're working on the film? Oh, yeah, no, everybody hated it. Like, like everybody working on it, everybody would just talk around, sit around and talk about how bad it was. I mean, it was, it was constantly... There, at every single phase, it was bad. Yeah. yeah, they were always trying to fix it, and it was always just like a different flavor of bad. It was like <laughs> always bad. Well, all the tires are flat. Well, let's set the car on fire. Maybe that will help. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. There's 
So, I recommend watching it simply because it is a wonderful lesson in what not so to do. So it, it's it, is it like ripe for an MST three K or is it? I don't even think it's worth that. Yeah. <laughs> So it's not even bad enough to be bad. No, well, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but my favorite thing to say about it is the moral of the story is it is more of a handicap to be a girl than it is to be blind. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, it's the story is about a girl who wants to be a knight, and she meets this blind guy who wants to be a knight, and he has to teach her how to do it because she's so inept. And, like, he teaches her how to just in time like that's the climax of the movie it's terrible it's everything about it's terrible well this next moment is I think probably safe to say a pivotal moment even if it was not necessarily the way your career would go long term no. but but it was certainly an opportunity to work on something that is now considered a landmark yes yes <laughs> So when did you come on board with this? Um, well, that was another case of like, you know, all these Quest for Camelot animators have contracts, so put them on Iron Giant. So like, I just kind of got swept up in the mix. How, how long did you work on it? Um, I want to say about a year. Okay. And what were you doing? What were you doing by that point? I was an animator. So you were full fledged. I, I, well, I was an animator. I, I got promoted to animator on Cats Don't Dance and was an animator on every right. project after that. So, what, did you work directly with Brad or? Um, at times, at times, um, Brad's. You know, and this is typical of the animation process at the time. Is every day the animators had director time, which was you know every day at I think like four thirty. If you had a animation you wanted Brad to review, he, we'd all go to a room and they'd load up our scenes and he'd wash them and tell us, you know, give us our notes and our feedback. So, you know, so at those moments, you know, he did look at my face and tell me <laughs> why do, why do you, you, you what were, I was doing wrong. You were sharing air with him and all these. Yeah, things. yeah. You know what? I have a funny story though. I had to do a, a scene. I, I animated a scene at the end of the movie where Dean is sitting on a bench and Annie is behind him talking to him. And um, I, you know, I, I did my thumbnails for the scene of how I wanted to do it. And the scene is where, you know, how many people have seen Iron Giant? Everybody? Does anybody remember the scene? Okay. All right. So, yeah, so Dean is like, Annie's like, this is your best work. And he's like, really? Is this my best work? Um, and I did my thumbnails for it and I had because you know Annie was supposed to feel like awkward and oh I'm saying the wrong things I made him stand up um, and cross his arms while she was trying to explain himself and I showed the thumbnails to Brad and he said like um, he said I, I just he's like he's bigger than her it's just like he just it just looks threatening and I said it won't be I swear it won't be like I'll, I'll make it I'll make it work it'll be great and he said I don't know and then he, he tried to like kind of, you know, because a lot of animators are this way, I'm definitely this way, where you start to explain acting or stuff and you start doing it yourself. And he started, he tried to like sh show me like, he's just, he's a guy and she's a woman. It just looks like he's threatening her. And then he tried to like, like lean into me like he was threatening me. And I'm taller than him. <laughs> Which, which, which isn't a jab at him because I'm taller than a lot of people. But, but this is what's awesome, is he actually got a chair and stood on it <laughs> so he could lean over me and demonstrate for me how like leaning over somebody looks like they're going to hit them. And, and, I still, and, and to his credit, like what a nice guy. I was like this young, you know, not very experienced animator going, like, no, just let me try. I'm going to do it. It's gonna, you're going to see. It's going to work. And I went back and I started doing it and I went like, he's right. <laughs> um, and yeah, so and then you all saw how it turned out. Yep. So in the same way that kind of you weren't having an a, uh, enthusiastic time working on Quest for Camelot, was there a sense you were doing something really amazing? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody on that movie was just excited to work on it. It was, it was different. It was, it was, it was, it was a moment where you're taking animation seriously. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a film. 
It has um, meat. It has gravitas. Yeah, and and you know everybody loved working for Brad. Brad was such a big deal, um, how, and so we were all excited about it. But I have to admit, I personally struggled on it. That is not a style of drawing that comes very naturally to me. Um, so it was like as as exciting as it was to be working on it. I spent the whole time going like <laughs> I'm not good enough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's really kind of be, and like by the t- by the end of the movie, and everybody says this, by the end of it, you finally feel like you've got a handle on the characters, Just but it's over. Yeah, 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 it's it's over. So there was the hope and the dream, and then there was the release. Yeah, same same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have an interesting statistic: the three movies you worked on. <laughs> cumulatively lost $130 million. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it was my fault, too. Yeah, well, just, you know, just, uh, no. I, thank you. Yes. Well, you know, clearly what this meant was it was oh. time to find a different format, right? <laughs> We kid because we love. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, what, what, was, what prompted you to... Uh, so Iron Giant, Warner Brothers decided they were going to make one more movie to, you know, they're like, we got to close this place down, but for some reason we have to make one more movie. They made Osmosis Jones, which I did not work on. Um, So what was happening at that time was like everybody was realizing that their dreams of, you know, hitting, getting Lion King money wasn't going to work. The studios were realizing that. And and so all this, this boom in animation was starting to go down and everybody was switching over to CG. And um, I decided that I wanted to keep drawing so I spent some time, you know, sending my portfolio and my reel around and looking for jobs. And I had, you know, my reels in at DreamWorks and Disney. But a friend of mine um, who was an, uh, an animator on Iron Giant um, was a director on the Powerpuff Girls. And this was a show that I had kind of grown to love. Um, I was watching it and it... Uh, before Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab actually really impressed me because I remember thinking, like, that was the first time in TV animation, like, as a professional, I knew the limits of, like, you know, money and budgets and features look beautiful because they have a lot of money and TV looks like crap because they don't have any money. And I watched Dexter's and I went, here are a bunch of people who realized that their resources were limited so they designed their show to work well within those limited resources, and I thought that was really smart. Like, I, I was really impressed by that. So then Powerpuff Girls came out and kind of blew my mind a little bit, like, and I kind of started getting a little geeky about it. So like, I started buying stuff, and so my friend Randy was a director on it, and, like, he gave me a drawing for my birthday, and I was so excited about it. Um, And then he told me they were looking for storyboard artists and I was looking for a job and wasn't quite getting anything and uh, had always been interested in story. In fact, when I was at CalArts, I was so intent on being a feature animator, but I had a storyboard teacher who was always telling me I should try story. So so I took a test. I took a a test for Powerpuff Girls. Um, They gave me a story outline and told me the sections they wanted me to board and write, which was a cool thing about Powerpuff Girls. You, they gave you a story structure and you wrote it and drew it. Did the section and um, I got offered the job the day I turned it in, <laughs> which felt really good. <laughs> um, that was good for my ego. Um, So I made the switch from animating for features to doing storyboards for TV. So this gives us a good opportunity to talk about, you know, animators are kind of in some ways at the end of the, of the, the, the pipeline because except for like color and paint, you know, they're, they're, they're taking storyboards which came out of script and came out of, you know, the recorded dialogue and there's not as much wiggle room by the time you get there. Mm-hmm. Whereas storyboard artists, you know, it seems like half the funny 
when you look at a lot of the shows I've looked at, comes out of the storyboarding yeah. stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a bad storyboarder can ruin a great joke. Um, but a good storyboarder can make something funny that wasn't even funny in the first place. Right. Yeah. So, do you, so it sounds like, from what you said, storyboarding is more satisfying. Um, in completely different ways. I, uh, animating is still the only thing for me that I ever got into that super zen place. Like the flow, what they call it. Yeah, where, you know, oh my God, did four hours just go by? Like that only ever happened to me with animating. Storyboarding, script writing, your, your brain is just chugging the whole time. You never, you never get lost. But it's, um, you know... Uh, fashioning stories like making up stories is extremely satisfying and like expressing I mean you know you express yourself when you're animating as well you're like wow I really understand what Sawyer's going through here I'm gonna pour all my emotions into her facial expressions but like with storyboarding it's like I, I went through what Blossom's going through here and I'm going to I'm gonna play it out for the world to see so um this was another pivotal moment in that you met someone. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Powerpuff Girls is where I met my husband. Um, he is the creator of the Powerpuff Girls. Um, Which started life as? Uh, the Whoop-Ass Girls, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Powerpuff Girls was Craig's student film. Um, but it was called The Whoop Ass Girls, so it wasn't Sugar Spice and, and uh, Chemical X. Sugar, Sugar Spice, Everything Nice, and Chemical X is what's on the show. It was originally Sugar Spice, Everything Nice, and a can of whoop ass. Um, which kind of makes more sense. But you can't say ass on TV, so, or for kids, on kids' TV anyway. Um, so, yeah, so that's, then it began the Powerpuff Girls. Right. So... When you came on board, I mean, for how closely were you, well, you? As a storyboarder, you must have been working very closely with him. Yes. So, was it? We have to ask the, you know, the. Uh, okay. What was it? Love at first sight <laughs> as you met across. Or, um. Okay. Well, apparently, yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, so there's two sides of the story. Uh, one of my side of the story was that, like, I worshipped the show, so I therefore worshipped him. Um, uh, and. From my last job, I, you know, one thing I told myself starting this new job was like, I have to stop being shy, I have to stop being intimidated by my superiors, and I need to talk to people. So I, Craig was the first person I tried this with. <laughs> it's like, this is somebody I admire, and um, I'm working for, but I'm going to talk to him like I'm an equal. And then he told me later, like, you know, it's, he, as soon as he saw me, he liked me. Um, <laughs> um, and what's kind of interesting is that, like, when I turned in my test, he was, like, afraid to look at it because he was afraid if it was bad, he, he would be disappointed. Um, so then he liked it, and then he was like, okay, do I like it because it's good, or do I like it because I want to talk to this girl? Um, <laughs> so he gave the test to Gendy, uh, Gendy Tarkovsky, you probably know who he is. Um, he gave the test to Gendy, who was the producer on the show, and said, like, and he said, told Gendy, he said, take a look at this test. And Gendy said, um, is it good? Do you like it? And Craig said, just look at it. And Gendy looked at it, and Gendy liked it, so Craig went, yes. Um, <laughs> so he went, okay, it's, I'm not biased. So Gendy was the one who actually hired me. So, like, we just, I don't know, it was the dorkiest courtship in the world. It, it, was, it was pure dorkiness. Um, he, my friend. I, I, I think we can figure that out a little bit from the C-3PO throw pillow. <laughs> the R2-D2, yeah. R2-D2, sorry. No, it was pure dorkiness. You know, he's from Star Trek. We, yeah. we just both, we just both kind of liked each other, so we both kind of just placed ourselves, like, near each other so we could talk, but we, like, never flirted we just talked and we would always go to my friend randy's room to and talk to each other in randy's room um like i'd go talk to randy or, or craig would go talk to randy and I'd go oh craig's talking to randy and now i'm gonna go talk to randy um it was totally completely stupid it was also terrifying because i was really afraid of what people were going to think of me um but uh we we could not deny our love um <laughs> 
So as bad as it looked for me to date my boss, I did. Well, that, that brings us to the question, I don't think this could happen today because... No, it still happens. <laughs> well, I'm thinking specifically, I mean, now, you know, if I were an employer of someone and, you know, because you immediately get into this vibe of, am I harassing her if I desk her for Well, a that's a very fine line that people have to walk. And right now the climate is very rough for that. So I don't know if a lot of people want to be real flirty out there right now because things are so rough. But um, it still, here's the thing. A animators and, and cartoonists and artists are unusual people. And, and we, we, we don't have the opportunities to find people we have things in common with outside of you know, our artistic communities. So it's, I know lots of couples who met each other on the job. I continue to see couples who, met, who meet each other on the job. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, just be a, you know, when you, if you like somebody, you know if you like them because you want to have a relationship and be in love or if you just want to give them a hard time and threaten them with blacklisting later. I mean, you know, you know when you're doing it. So it, 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 it still happens. Right. It, it, it's, it's okay. So, <laughs> something else I wanted to bring out because I think people are unclear about it is, so, Craig created this, he created it as a student. Mm -hmm. He doesn't own it. He owned it when he was a student. Yes. Uh, when Cartoon Network bought Powerpuff Girls, optioned Powerpuff Girls, they, they own it. Like, and that's how everything works. You know, it's, it's like, they're like, we're going to spend millions of dollars making it. It's ours. And we will share some of the toy profits with you and we'll give you a salary to make it. And, you know, other, you know, other, other, some people create stuff and don't work on it. You, you work your deal out, but studios own their properties. So when people say, you know, oh, well, they'll, should, they'll never stand for that. I mean, there's, you've got limited, you know, the creator would never let that happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a weird misperception that, like, people will, like, contact Craig and go, hey, Craig, why don't you make Powerpuff Girls for Netflix? Because like, I don't own Powerpuff Girls and Cartoon Network. So talk to Cartoon Network and see if they want to work with Netflix. Like, right. people just don't understand that that's a thing. Right. Yeah. My, my favorite thing is when ponies came around, oh, the hub won't let them do that. It's like, the Hub is just a distributor of a product made by yeah. a company which, oh, well, DXA, DHX, well, they, they yeah. just a contractor, you know. So they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, but that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's the business side yep. of it. It's boring. Yep. So one other theme we see coming up here is some familiar names start to show up, like McCarthy and Rogers and Morrow and Savino. Mm -hmm. You're kind of, and it's like your posse. You know, we see these <laughs> same people showing up. It's not up. really a posse. You say like a community, maybe. Well, it, it, well it's kind of very Whedon-esque in that the same names start showing up over and over again. Are you sure? Well, you find people who have similar sensibilities to you and, and people that you enjoy working with. And oh, that's our wedding picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's got just a little bit of deer in the headlights look there. No, he doesn't. He was very happy. Yeah. Um, uh, you, know, you, 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 and as you know, as you move around, you want your show to be good. You go, oh boy, I really enjoyed working with Amy. I'm going to call Amy. Or you go, like, oh, this will be a really good. So and so has a. Uh, this it, this would be a really good project for them. Like they have the kind of strengths we need for this sort of project. So it's not really a posse, but you do have like your pool of of artists go, and go friends. Go-to people. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So how did the decision come to kind of wind it down? Was that Powerpuff? Part? Yeah. Um, both Powerpuff Girls and Fosters. You just, you know, you tell 10 bazillion stories and you find yourself in the story room going like, I don't know, what should we tell this time? Like, in the beginning, it's all exciting. All the stories are sitting there and they're so obvious and then your characters start to evolve and grow and, and that's exciting because you're, you're exploring new territory you weren't planning on. And then at a certain point, you just feel like you've exhausted the ideas and everything's starting to get a little thin or a little repetitive or a little weird and you've been working on it six years and you're getting kind of bored. So both of those shows just kind of like, it's time to end, yep. you know. 
Which brings us to Foster's. Yeah, Foster's. So, th- you were in on this from the start. Yes, this was fun because this was my f- the very first thing I worked on where I got in on the ground floor. So, what's the process with you and Craig? I mean, he's got the creator credits on this. Was yeah. this an idea he already had in his head and brought the or? No, this was after the Powerpuff Girls movie. Craig decided he he didn't want to keep making Powerpuff. Um, he wanted. He wanted to do something new, so he just sat down with his sketchbooks and just started drawing a million bazillion things, and he started drawing these, like, kind of wacky... This is right before, like, Urban Vinyl. You guys familiar with that type of toy that was real popular about 10 years ago? Um, This was when, right before that got popular, and there was, like, a lot of, like, underground artists who were just making these vinyl sculptures of weird creatures, and Craig was really into that, so... He, um, uh, this is my office at Foster's with my good friend who was a production coordinator, Tammy List. Um, uh, so he just sat down and started sketching everything. And that was also cool because even though Craig created it and, and um, you know, uh, it's his original idea, I was there when he started it all, so like every day he was bouncing ideas off so, of so me. So there was a kibitzing process going. Yeah, well, I have a you know a developed by credit on it. So Craig created it, and he and I and Mike Moon developed it, like right. turned it into a show. Right. So it has a very different animation style from Powerpuff in some ways, and yeah, and different from the other shows. How much of that is driven by whatever technology you're going to be using, and how much by just wanting a certain feel? Um, I'd say it was driven. It would be driven by both. Um, Craig's uh, animation style is very flat and graphic, and um, at least especially back then, and and that's what he likes to do. But at the time, Powerpuff Girls would was a little frustrating because it was done overseas in Korea, um, people you know, with non-English speakers. So we never got like a lot of good nuance or acting, and sometimes you know the drawings wouldn't come back as great as we wanted them to. So by the time Fosters came around, Flash started becoming a thing that you could do, you could use for more than just the web. So we started, we, we were playing around with the idea of doing it in Flash and started kind of sending tests out to studios that were animating in Flash and uh, found a studio in Ireland called Boulder Media that just did some beautiful, beautiful flash animation. And, and it was limited at the time, but because the characters were so graphic, it, it translated really nicely. So we were able to get stronger, like nuanced acting and, and funnier timing because we were working with animators who were English speakers. And also, you know, at a certain point, um, we were animating half the shows in Burbank, and that was like the first time in decades that television was being animated in the States. So that obviously had a good run and yeah. was very, very well critically. I loved that job. Received. We had a lot of fun making right. Fosters. This was also about the time. When did um, Milky Way kind of start to appear in your head? So Milky Way, let's see, when did it start appearing in my head? Um, oh, okay, so I was developing an Adult Swim project that they didn't like called um, Lollipop Sucky Life. Um, <laughs> And it was about a girl named Lollipop who was basically strawberry shortcake. Um, and when she was little, she lived in Lollipopolis with her, her posse, the Candy Kids, and they were all sweet, sweet and adorable. And the show was about her going, growing up to be 18 and going to college. And she was no longer sweet, she was bitter. Um, and she went to college to, and she was like exploring life, you know, so she was like, there were all these like 80s kids toys that were doing the sorts of, you know, debauched things that people do in college. Um, (laughs) There were, uh, you know, the frat guys were Care Bears that got drunk on honey. There were, you know, and my ravers, because rave was big at the time, were Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls, and they would drop stardust and dance until they died. Um, 
So that's where they started. Um, so I loved that idea. Um, <laughs> that's, it's, it almost has a, like a drawn together vibe to it. Yeah, yeah. It was it was supposed to be terrible. Um, it was all very bad. Um, but um, when I was writing up the Milky Way and the Galaxy Girl Raver Kids, I was kind of going like, hey, these are actually kind of legit. Like, like I could like make this not bad. <laughs> And maybe it could be a thing. So I started kind of developing that like on the side on my own for fun. And I just sort of, I don't know, I just kind of fell in love with it and just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. So it, its life has really been as a doll. Set. Yeah. Well, I was at that time, you know, having been a producer and a director, I, I had been pitching shows to studios around town and you know, any, anybody who's listened to anything I've talked about before knows that, like, you know, I always complain that, you know, people just didn't want girls' shows for girls. Like, like it, it just, anything I developed, what I was like, can you make it about boys? Or we're not looking for stuff for girls right now. And I was really tired of people telling me that girls, the thing that they said all the time then was, girls don't like animation. And I just kept saying, no, girls don't like bad animation. And every time you make something for girls, you make it bad. Um, but nobody was listening to me. So, um, so, so, so I said, like, nobody's going to tell me that girls don't like dolls. So I, I kind of left animation for a little while and pursued, you know, because I learned a lot from Powerpuff Girls about, like, toys and licensing and stuff. So I wanted to kind of, I thought maybe I could do this. So I, I did, I designed them as a line of dolls. I did a little book, made some T-shirts and stuff and sold them at conventions. And they were in FAO Schwartz for a very short time, but that was like the Christmas that the stock market crashed. So like nobody was buying $50 dolls that year. So <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't pan out. So um, interestingly, you lost the website in 2016. Did I? <laughs> that, that's what, that's what I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you evidently have lost the website, so you. Yeah, I. You know what? I kind of let it. I let it go. I, I let it go. Is it hard to like, you know, when you're not coming from a franchise? Is it hard to kind of launch something like that? Oh, very much so. The thing, you know, and I was still, I learned a lot from it, but at the time, like, this was all news to me. Like, the shocker to me was that everywhere I took it, they loved it. Everybody loved it, but nobody wanted it. And I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Um, and toys, toys is, is rough. Like, what I found, like, here I was, like, stepping away from animation to make toys so that I could target girls, but all these people who were interested in making them as toys were like, make, it, make an animated TV show and we'll do it. And I was like, I just left animation. Like, like, so like, there's this weird like, cross-pollination sort of thing. So all of a sudden, I'm like going backwards. Here's something I never developed to be TV, and I'm trying to like, pound it into a TV-shaped box and that it didn't fit in. Um, and now that like the rights were tied up, like studios that had good budgets, like Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, like they didn't want it because they didn't want to own it. So only like these like like low budget kind of non union studios that make bad cartoons. Uh, it's just a long, long horrible story. So it was, um, yeah. It just it it. I don't ever want to try it again. <laughs> Moral of the story. Right. So this brings us to what some people in the room may know you best for. <laughs> so, this is the silver lining to Galaxy Girls. So, Galaxy Girls didn't work out, but I did have a pitch. Um, my agent set me up to pitch Galaxy Girls to Hasbro. And I pitched it to this wonderful executive, Lisa Lick, who I love to this day. She was new, she had come from Fox, and I pitched Galaxy Girls to, it, to her, and at the end she went, I don't like it. <laughs> well, she wasn't that blunt. But basically she said like, well, I'm not sure this is right for Hasbro, but would you be interested in this? And she pulled out a My Little Pony DVD, and it was funny because she said, I haven't watched it, it's probably not very good. 
She said, but, because she was new, and she said, but can you take a look at it and see if there's anything you think you can do with it? So she liked Galaxy Girls enough to think that maybe I could do something cool with My Little Pony, and I really liked that she came from this set, this mindset of what they're doing now probably isn't very good. Um, I didn't think it was. So I, I, yeah, so I just, I kind of dipped my toe in the water just thinking, like, in general animation, people don't want to work for toy companies. Um, there's just a lot of nightmare stories about them. So I was very reserved. You know, they're, they're more concerned with their market research than they are with good storytelling. It's what is often the case. And, uh, and that led to that article that, kind of brought you on the scene. Yes, that, that insane The death article, of creator... The death of creator-driven animation. So is anybody, was anybody around when that Cartoon Brew article came out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that idea came up with that, or, or, or that, that, that idea came through. So that, that, that's actually a very good example of what people thought and still think for the most part of, of trying to do shows for, for cartoons. So the writer of that article... Never saw it. Never. Well, it was before it even came out. It was before it even came out and used it as this calling card to say, like, this is the death of creator-driven animation. And it called me and my head writer, Rob Renzetti, who's, like, an amazingly talented guy, called us, what he called us, like, mindless drones or sellouts or something like that. And he'd never even seen it. He'd, like, never, hadn't even seen it. It's kind of like people reviewing Apple products today. It's uh, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the techies in the audience get that joke. Uh, <laughs> all right. So in the interest of saving you some sanity in the future, we're going to do a little speed round here. Okay. And you can disavow any knowledge of these things if they weren't on the, on the, uh, the plate when you left. Of in pony? In yeah. In okay. Terms, okay. Cadence and Shining Armor. Yes. What about them? Were, were, had, had they, like, appeared? Um, that was the last story I broke. Um, but her name wasn't Cadence. That was changed after I left, and she wasn't an alicorn. So uh, yep. last I was involved with her, she was a unicorn named Mia Moore. But was Shining Armor Twy's brother? Yes. Okay. Uh, changelings? Yes. Okay. Sea ponies? Um, I had a concept for sea ponies before the show even started, but I, sea ponies were never realized when I was right. involved. Questria girls? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer, but Princess Twilight Sparkle? No. AJ's parents' fate? Uh, sort of. Um, I had always imagined that they, that their parents had died, but I knew that. Um, although, is it different now? It, they've they've hinted very strongly. But that they died. Did they specify how no, they died? No. Okay. I had always in my head canon they had died, but I just knew that I would never be allowed to say so. We, we, we just assume they've been at the store for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so they're neglectful. That's yes. way right. better. Right. Yes. <laughs> Scootaloo's parents. Does she have parents now? No. Um, yeah, I, I never... Scootaloo's parents are at home. <laughs> they're hanging out. Right. Yeah, they're, she's, you know... I never thought there was anything weird about Scootaloo's right, parents. Right. We just, they're so boring, we didn't bother talking about them. And the origins of Celestia and Luna. Um, which still haven't been really resolved. I have some loose ideas about that, but I never solidified right. it. So, um, some of the challenges with show, let's talk just a little bit of a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to make the comment, yes, we're running behind. And Sorry, I we, talk too much. No, it's also because we started late, but, you know, I will try to get it through so we have time for questions. Um, one question is, so when you're working with, with storyboard artists and things, obviously there's things that are put in in storyboard stage that aren't in the script and aren't in the Bible. So when you got, have something like this, which is when you were there, 
What is that from? That is from The Perfect Stallion. The what? You know, the Hearts and Hooves episode. Oh, um, you know what? I did not see uh, season two. I, I supervised, I, I broke all the stories, did the story room and did a lot and went through a lot of the scripts. Yeah. I did not see a lot of the final okay. product in season two. So okay. I don't recognize but this let, at all. Let, let us imagine that this had crossed, you know, your path. I mean, this is kind of implying that Catholicism made a toehold in Equestria. <laughs> Oh, is that what that is? That, that's a dog collar there, you know, a, a, oh. a clerical collar, and it's clearly a funeral, so it's like, you know, when things like that show up in storyboard, you know, and in the post-storyboard, I mean, do people, like, you know, where does continuity come into it, and, you know, on a short list, do you care, or? Is no, it... yeah, I definitely care. Um, you know, it, it's like you want your crew to feel a part of it, and you want everybody to feel they have some creative say and autonomy, so, like, whenever some, a deviation crosses your desk, you go, like, is this something I'm cool with, and I usually want to let things go, but sometimes something will come through and just like, that just doesn't belong here, and you have to say no. Yeah. Um, I'd have to see the context of that. That's, I, that's like... I don't know if I would approve you know, of that 40, character 45 design. 45 frames of, you know, the, the lyrics for that is, he's too old, and she jumps on him, and it's in a song, and she scratches his head and runs away. And that's the entire ah. context. Of <laughs> and someone made it a funeral? Yes. That had nothing else to do with anything else? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I you know... Yeah, okay. I, 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 don't, I don't know what I would have done right. with that. So the, <laughs> the other thing I want to talk about is what TV tropes would call the cloud cuckoo landers. Yeah. The, the, the people who, for whom the laws of physics are superseded by the laws of funny. Uh-huh. So when you're writing for those kind of characters, how do you, I mean, since essentially... You know, if it's suddenly Pinkie Pie being on the other side of town mm -hmm. faster than Rainbow Dash because when he hides, she's going to appear or something like that. Yeah. How, I mean, how do you balance out, you know, that's a really funny beat with, okay, now I've got this, like, OP, you know, totally overpowered character or, you know, Discord could do anything he wanted, evidently, if it suits his Um, mind. You know, I'm actually pretty lax on that kind of stuff because for me, I'm a little bit more like what works for the story and what's funny. Um, so sometimes, yes, Pinkie Pie can run as faster than, get across town faster than Rainbow Dash because that's funny or that's what works for the story, but why didn't she do that when this happened? It's like, well, because then the story would be bad. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, so I, I tend to be pretty lax about that kind of stuff. However, I would never let anybody but Pinkie Pie do that. Like, there were some early, sto or early season one stories where there was a thing where, like, Rainbow Dash was talking through a cloud and the storyboarder had changed it to her, the cloud being a door that she could or couldn't lift, and... I had yeah, to so say, like, very fourth wall type. Yeah, and I was like, we have to save that for Pinkie Pie. Otherwise, she's not special. She's the only one who can do that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and Discord, because. Well, yeah, but he does it in an evil way. Yes. He, it makes more sense for Discord to do it because he's magical, and Pinkie yeah. Pie is an earth pony, so she's yes. not. So she's just weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. One of the difficulties working on the show is you were divorced from your storyboard artists and your production crew. Not entirely. I, I was not working with them one-on-one -on -one directly, but the, storyboarder, the storyboards would come to me across my desk, and I had the opportunity to make notes and revisions. Right. But, that, but that's not the normal situation you normally have in production, is it? No. Well, it depends on how your productions run. Usually, you, you launch your storyboard artist. So you sit with, you know, as the showrunner and then the director, and the storyboard artist comes in, and you go, you read the script. Let's talk about it. Here are your character designs. Here's the stuff we want to see, la, 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 la. And then you send them off with all this information. Then they bring it back to you. You get a chance to go, mm, let's change this, or this could be like this, or ooh, this gives me a new idea. They do a revision, and then it's done. It's like that, that's not how it was. Like yeah. I sent the script off, and then six weeks later, I get a storyboard to review. Right, so that probably was a little difficult. Um, what was difficult about it was the speed of the schedule. Like, you, you, you do what you need to do. I mean, that, that's fine. But, like, when you have, you know, when you don't have the authority to hire the storyboard artists you know, 
and somebody turns something in and it's not what you expected and then they tell you you've got two days to revise it, then you know, you're not sleeping right. and you're getting sick and that's not good. Okay. So during the, you know, after season one and into season two, you made the decision that you needed to move on. Yeah. Was that kind of a blind jump or did you have an idea where you wanted to land? No, I was totally blind. I, had to, I just had to stop. I was really sick. Okay. So you landed in a fairly interesting place. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how did you come to start doing shorts with teenage superheroes? Uh, this is kind of like weird. Um, so Craig was at Disney and he was under contract at Disney. He was developing Wander Over Yonder and um, uh, Warner Brothers, who works with DC, went to him and said like, hey, we're doing, these, we're doing shorts for DC Nation and we're letting people take lesser known superheroes in the DC universe and doing like funny, silly shorts with it and we're giving everybody a lot of creative freedom. And Craig was like, oh, I'm under contract with Disney. I don't, I'm not allowed to. And, and I was like, ooh, ooh, me, 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 me. I, I want to do one, I want to do one. And they were like, yeah, like, which, <laughs> which was kind of nice. They were like, oh my God, we forgot about you. Um, <laughs> they're like, thank you for reminding us yeah. because yeah. Um, which was nice. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I threw together a pitch with these three. I actually had an additional uh, pitch with, with um, Power Girl, but they like this one better. Um, and uh, yeah, so th that was fun. Right. Now, I, I have to ask just because this is, again, an issue today. Th this animation style we're seeing, not so much with Supergirl, who is beefy, but with the other two, it's very narrow and thin and stretched and there's a lot of concern today about body image yeah with women do you, i mean how do you, again is there do you think you can do this style without it kind of saying you know women should be like barbie no okay so i personally don't feel like they are barbie-ish so here's the thing um when i went to do this i wanted to show diverse body types that's why Supergirl is big, and she's big because she's strong, and strong people have muscles, right? Wonder Girl is tall and thin, and let me tell you, being tall and thin isn't awesome. When you're skinny and you're taller than the boys, it, it's not awesome when you're a teenager, and your feet are really big, and you don't have any boobs, it's not awesome. So, um, so, and, and Batgirl is, she's petite, she's very short, and all my friends in high school who are really short, yeah, not awesome. So I, I really wanted to show diverse body shapes with this, and Wonder Girl is, I mean, I don't know, I don't feel like she looks like Barbie. Um, she looks like how I felt when I was her age, and she's also an Amazon. Amazons are incredibly tall and incredibly tall people when they're 16 are incredibly skinny. So, I, I mean, I tried to come from a place of reality and I felt like I was really trying to show diversity in body shapes. Okay. I wasn't accusing. I was just oh, okay. <laughs> it's just because we see this a lot with like Monster High. and of course Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it and I, I, I try not to do that. Yeah. So, do you have any interest in doing anything? I mean, you're obviously going to be in the DC Universe again, mm -hmm. but... Would you like to go back to these guys at all? Well, what we're doing, uh, so I'm rebooting DC Superhero Girls for, uh, and it's a total reboot. It is completely new, and we are taking the tone and the humor and the themes of Super Best Friends Forever and bringing it over to DC Superhero Girls and expanding it out instead of three girls, it's six girls, but these personalities and these voice actresses, that is our Supergirl and our Batgirl and our Wonder Woman in awesome. DC Superhero Girls. So after this brief hiatus into shorts, you moved over and you were at Disney. Yes. And I will just say very briefly, this was a show I was prepared to hate because oh. I don't normally like the kind of naive Forrest Gumpy characters, but it is so marvelously subverted uh -huh. in the show. He knows what he's doing. 
He does, and he knows he's what that alien <laughs> that alien wants to kill him. Yeah. He just, he just thinks it's cute. Yeah. So um, I had to ask, this is one opportunity to ask about. So like Foster's was toy pianos, and mm-hmm. this is banjo music. Mm-hmm. You know, where does that decision for like a musical style that's come Craig. from? That's Craig. That's Craig. That's not me. Craig, yeah. Craig is a huge music guy and has a lot of like opinions and listens to a lot of really cool stuff no one's ever heard of before. So that, that's... That's a big thing for him, yep. yeah. So I also have to add this as, as a thing. How did you get John Hodgman to be the Lord of Illumination? Um, we asked him. <laughs> there isn't much more to it than that, you know, especially when you're working with Disney and they've, they've got a little extra cash and yeah. a really good casting department. You just contact people. They yeah, say yes or they say no. Yeah. He said yes. So I have to ask, you know, the one of the questions I had watching shows, who is this aimed at? Because... Like, you're doing alien references, and, you know, less <laughs> filling tastes great as a battle cry. You know, it's... <laughs> hates, hates great, best filling. Yes. Yes. Hates great, yes so. uh, well, here's the thing. Okay, so this is, this is something both Craig and I believe very strongly about um, uh, uh, references like that. Yeah. We did an alien reference, but if you never saw Alien, you would still think that was a fun show. Yeah. If you... Hates great, best villain works as a like a like a evil mantra for an army of your evil million, minions to say whether or not you know anything about taste great less filling which is old 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 <laughs> um so that's i am a huge believer in that you do not put a pop culture reference in unless somebody who does not know the pop culture reference will still be entertained by it all right so we're we're doing hyperspeed here so this is your Writers there. Yeah, this was the writer, the season one writing team right. on on uh, Wander of Yonder. So we're going to do a brief in and out to the next topic. Okay, <laughs> sorry, so, I gotta, yeah. I gotta, I gotta be a little less verbose. Yeah. Um, how did Medusa come to you? Um, Sony called my agent. Um, that was kind of it. They, they, um, from how they put it to me was, you know, Frozen made a bazillion dollars, and the the head of the studio at Sony, who's a woman at the time, was like, where's my kick-ass girl movie? They had this in their, in their pocket, and they called me, and they thought I could do it, so they called me and right. asked me if I wanted to do it. It's in development with a new person, but it, uh, from, from what I hear, it's, it doesn't sound like it's going anywhere right. soon. They've, they've got other projects they're more excited about. So, you then took a slight detour to be family. Yes, yes, yes. Um, a different uh, kind of production. Yes, a very different kind of production. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right, right around that time, um, we got pregnant with my daughter. Okay. Yeah. Whose name is? Her name's you... Quinn. Not Harley Quinn. Though. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. not, not at all. Not yes. even close, no. Um, how old is she now? She just turned 18 months. Okay. So... Um, is there somewhat of a double, you know, you hear about the double standard that women have to defer, you know, um, having kids because you have to build your career and then you can take time off. Was that a factor at all for you? Or is this- yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not mean to be such an old mom. <laughs> but awesome. What's that? But awesome. And think about all the shows you can show her. She's great. Are you going to okay, show? so from what I understand from my, you know, my friends who with kids, it's like they never like your shows. <laughs> they don't. They like everybody else's shows. So apparently that's incredibly typical. They don't like your shows. Well, one of the things I'm going to ask you, so it, it sounds very much like you haven't followed ponies since. I, I have not, no. Right. Do you think you might go back and watch latest stuff with her once? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to be a it, big bitter jerk, is, but is it just too, I'm a big bitter jerk. Too, too hard to go back. I mean, the stuff's still kind of like your name's still on the label. Yeah. Um. It, you know. Yeah. You know. I. It. It. It was very upset. Leaving the show and losing the show was very upsetting for a long time, and I'm finally on the other side of it, and I don't want to risk right. opening that back up again. It. Right. It. It was very hard. It do, was very do, hard to leave the show. Does, does it give you any sense of pride to see it just made a big theatrical, you know, splash? Um. No. It just makes me mad. I couldn't do it. Okay. I, I'm a big bitter jerk. I'm a big, huge bitter jerk. I'm sorry. I. I just am. Yeah. Right. Okay. So very quickly, moving on to. Um, We'll skip that because we talked about it. So, um, <laughs> and it doesn't look like that anymore. Yes. 
Right. Um, so um, them fighting herds is an interesting case. I just really want to talk. I mean, first of all, when are we going to, as a, pre as a supporter, when are we going to get it? Um, sometime soon. <laughs> oh, so it's like every other Kickstarter I ever supported. That's, <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows what they're getting into with Kickstarter. Yeah. I'm still waiting for lockpick set from 2011. Um, but I want to ask a question. So I think most people's reaction to, oh, here's a story about my, my characters who all are friends with each other beating the crap out of each other would not have been to say, what a neat idea, let me help you. <laughs> Um, I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> I, I loved it. Um, so I liked, uh, so Them start Fighting Herd started as a, po uh, who's familiar with it? Anybody? In okay. Yeah. So some of you, so all of you probably know it started as a My Little Pony fan game called Fighting is Magic, um, where it was the main cast of Pony, the main six, fighting each other, and it's just like a typical fighter game. Um, but it was beautifully done, it was animated well, and what I was impressed by was that the characters were fighting in style. character. Yeah, in style. Their per they were fighting with, in their personality, because anybody can give a cute pony a gun and say, oh, that's so hilarious, like, that, that's too obvious. They were, they were having their moves be their, pers their personalities, and like, I was really impressed, and I was watching it, and I was waiting for it to come out. I was a fan. So then, like, right before they finished it, they got an NDA. Um, they, uh, they got a little bit too publicit, publicized, I think. Yeah, they, they got a little too popular. Not an NDA, a cease and desist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, they would have wanted an NDA. But they, yeah, yeah, right. No, they got a cease and desist, and that's... That's the risk you take. They didn't own the characters. You know, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it sucked. So I felt really bad for them because I know how hard they worked on it. Um, I'd never been in touch with them personally in any capacity, but I tweeted them and I was like, do you want some original character designs? Um, so, and then it just kind of went from there. Um, I offered to do them character designs and then the more we worked together, it was more, I ended up doing more and more. I was doing the designs. I was coming up with world concepts. I was doing turns and mouth charts and writing stuff and I'm still writing stuff for it now and um, it became a much bigger thing. But it's fun and it's cool and, and the guys are really great to work with. Just like very passionate and it's a real labor of love. All right, so we have... We want to have a little bit of time for a few questions. Uh, the prints are being handed out now, so you will all be getting a lovely print that Lauren has signed and probably shortened her, her uh, storyboarding life by doing. Oh, um, I've had so much so, worse. <laughs> um, if there are any folks in the audience who have questions, and I'd like to, if there's any CalArts folks to ask first, but otherwise just anyone come up. We have a mic up here. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll We're, try to keep it short yes. so we can get through as many as possible. Yeah, go. Um, I would like to ask quest two questions. Um, I just forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my second question. Yes. What do you think is the biggest mistake you've ever made in your artistic career? <laughs> oh my goodness, how do I pick? <laughs> um, okay, so I think the biggest mistake I ever made was trying to draw like someone else. Trying to draw like someone else. So it's good to mimic people that you admire because you learn a lot from it. But as soon as I, I let go and said, I'll never draw like that guy and, and tried to think, draw my own way, things got a lot easier. That's a bit, that was a big mistake. And my first question I just remembered uh, was, what's the biggest mistake you can do when pitching an, anima an, 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 an animated show? Um, being unconfident. So go in there, you got, it isn't that it's the biggest mistake you can make, but the best thing you can do is go in there and pitch it like it's the most amazing thing ever. Um, but keep, uh, but also kind of being succinct about it. Cause as soon as you start kind of hemming and hawing or, or they sense you doubting yourself, then they start doubting it too. So you just got to go in there and be like, oh my God, you guys are going to be so excited because I'm bringing this awesome thing to you. And like, that's the most important thing. We need to let the rest of the folks go. Uh, thank you. 
Hi. Um, in the last panel you did in this one, you talked a lot about the shyness you had growing up. Yeah. Um, just for someone who does struggle with a lot of severe shyness, is there any advice you have for just learning and pushing yourself to be more confident and engage with people more? You have to not be afraid to embarrass yourself. Okay. Because you will, but you just, but you'll never do it again. You know, once you say something stupid, you will never say that stupid thing ever, ever, <laughs> ever again. So you just, I mean, that's the thing is, is to push yourself, but never, I always like to say, like, I'm not going to let the fact that I'm stupid stop me. <laughs> okay. You know, it, it's like you, you got to let your, you got to f- forgive your mistakes and you got to go in there going, I might make a fool out of myself, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because at it. a certain <laughs> point you stop, you just get used to it and it stops happening. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey. Sure. Sir. Sure. Good evening, Ms. Faust. Hi. So um, here I have the Art of Equestria book, and in it, I read the introduction, and in it, there was talk about the Pitch Bible, and the Pitch Bible for My Little Pony Friendship is Magic took two years in development, approximately. Is that correct? Nope. Really? Six weeks. Six weeks? No, I should ask. <laughs> I've been lied to. <laughs> Regardless, though. Uh, yeah. It probably took, it took two years for me to pitch it and for it actually become a thing, but I, I pulled it together in six weeks. Now, we should ask, because I sent it to you, is the thing that's out on the internet now the Bible? Mostly. So that is the Hasbro Bible. So I did a pitch Bible, and then Hasbro took it and made it an internal document. So I think most of the writing is what I wrote, but a lot of the art is different, and a lot of the art I had in my original Bible is not in there. Okay, and my my question is related to uh, pitch Bibles. What advice or advice is, in simpler terms, because we have a time limit, what advice can you give someone like myself who has many ideas to present or would like to present? Um, Start writing it down. Because once you have the materials down... It, it makes you think of more things. It also helps you organize them. Uh, one thing, big thing I do for a Bible is I do what I call a, a, a dummy, where I go, this is the page where I'm going to talk about the world, and this is the page where I'm going to talk about the characters, and this is the page. So I kind of have this template, and then I start going, if somebody was just going to ask me about this part, what would I say? So it helps you kind of organize the thoughts that you have, and once you do, you start seeing connections and it helps you kind of, uh, it Build just helps more. things grow and solidify. But you got to actually sit down and do it. Because it might be a big mess when you start, but you start seeing the holes and you start filling the holes and you start seeing the connectors and you start putting them together. So you just got to sit down and start doing it. Thank you. Okay, we have probably time for two or three more questions. Oh, no. Okay, so. Uh, uh, yep. Don't worry, just duck. Yeah, just okay. duck, please. Um, what is your opinion on Equestria Girls? I haven't watched oh, Equestria okay. Girls, um, so I don't. I can't. I can't speak to the quality. I will say I was a little disappointed when I heard that they were they were making them into girls and putting them in high school because that's all anybody does for girls. So conceptually, I was a little I was a little disappointed in that, but I haven't seen it, so I, I can't really say if I, if it's good or bad. It's got some nice music. I'll give it that. That's good. Yes. Um, how, um, Good. Hello. Um, I got one question. W- how do you? What do you think about the movie? If you don't, and what would you change about that? I movie? haven't seen it. Oh. <laughs> bitter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> very so, bitter. So very very bitter. I'm busy. I'm very busy. <laughs> I have a very little baby. I don't see movies anymore. Yeah, yeah. Lauren, you mentioned having an idea of Celestia and Luna's backstory. I was wondering if you might be able to explain that a little bit, as well as how you'd conceptualize unicorn magic in Equestria, such as them using it as like a magic wand, the horn, and so on. Um, you know, I don't have enough. I had a bunch of different ideas of what I wanted Celestia and Luna's um, uh, backstory to be, but I, I can't say I really solidified anything. I was trying to think about like who their parents were and, and, and what their purpose was. You know, the idea that they've lived for thousands of years and like what was Equestria like. The one idea that I did have is that their temple, their, their, the ruins that was in Everfree Forest, that was not originally Everfree Forest. 
that was originally part of Equestria and that Everfree Forest was kind of slow over the centuries encroaching over. That's like one idea that I knew I had. Like that was originally like the capital royal city of Equestria. And now it's stuck in the middle of Everfree Forest. But I had two, I have a lot of different thoughts I had on those two that, and I haven't thought about them in years because there's nothing I can do about them. But with, with um, Unicorn Magic, um, I always wanted it to be limited to who they are. Like everything re revolves around that cutie mark. So whatever it is your cutie mark is about and who you are, you as a unicorn, your magic is limited thematically to whatever your cutie mark is, is, tells you about you. But how does Rainbow Dash lift a mug? <laughs> she should, she, they, shouldn't be, they shouldn't have mugs. Mugs are for people with fingers. Right. My, my, there, my, there should be no mugs. My opinion is it's Velcro. Yeah, no, that shouldn't be happening. Right. All right. Thank you. I do not approve. And I hate to say it, this got to be the last question. So sorry. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts of uh, that other countries have adapted My Little Pony and made their own conventions in different countries and um, how they expanded their influence onto the, your drawings, into their culture. It's mind-blowing and beyond flattering, and I'm incredibly honored. Like, it's, it's, I think it's any artist's dream to have their work inspire other people and to know that it's inspired people all around the world of different cultures is, like, something you don't even dare to dream happen. So it's, it's just mind-blowingly amazing and humbling, and, and right. I'm honored. I do want to ask one very quick question before I wrap up, because it reminded me. So I've seen, like, the Japanese translation of, of the show, and half the joke, I mean, there's always a difficulty in translating, but half the jokes just aren't there anymore. So how, you know, do you guys get involved in that at all? Is that just totally... Different? I've never been involved in any of the shows I've worked on. I've never known the American production to be a part of the translation. There's no time for that. <laughs> right. All right. Well, I have, I'm afraid we do have to wrap it up. Make sure you get your print before you leave. I'd like to thank Lauren for spending so much time with us today. 